to make it full panel. Uh, we start our webinar for today, uh, and the topic for today is invasive fungal infections. I thank Sipla for providing the digital platform for our webinars. Uh, today's uh, speaker is none other than Dr. Vivek Nagia. He is the principal director and consultant at uh, Pulmonology Department at Max Sake. And I think he needs no introduction. And I'm sure he's uh, going to take a wonderful talk. He's taken a talk for us earlier also on NIV, which was well appreciated. Thank you, sir, for spending your time. And uh, to moderate the session, we have none other than uh, Dr. Uh, Prakash Shastri, sir. Sir is vice chairman at Gangaram, as most of you know. So without further ado, sir, uh, I will start now. I hand it over to you. So, Dr. Shastri, would you want to say a few words before I start? Yeah, I would. I thought I would. Uh, Tapesh would invite me, but uh, he's the boss. Uh, so I didn't no, sir, that's right. I thought Anyway, uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, this is. Yeah, Tapesh, uh, good evening yes, to sir. you again. And uh, it is indeed a great pleasure to be moderating a session uh, for a close friend, very close friend, and a friend from the last 20, 25 years, I would say, and uh, a person who has got the right credentials. Uh, he has done an infection disease course from uh, London and uh, in areas of active practice that I have been uh, sharing uh, so many occasions uh, our experience together uh, so I have absolutely no doubt that uh, this present topic the today's topic on invasive fungal infections in the intensive care unit is absolutely the right person to deal with it and I'm sure that the next 20 minutes or 25 minutes that he is going to speak upon uh, will provide us with the wealth of experience that he has had over so many years and uh, we indeed cherish uh, his presence and uh, we have had so many things to learn from him and i'm sure we'll learn so much from him today also over to you vivek thank you dr shastri i think nobody could have been better than you to be chairing this session I mean, you yourself have been deep into fungal infections over the last so many years and of course i'd like to thank the page for inviting me today and of course congratulate him also for running this show so very well i was just seeing this is the 44th webinar that he's conducting and purely out of academic interest than anything else so congratulations, Dr. Tapesh, and thank you for inviting me. So are you all able to see my screen now? Yes, yes. Screen is very well visible, sir. Okay, excellent. So let me start with introducing the fact that there are two types of fungi that we deal with in our day-to-day -day practice, the yeast and the molds. The invasive fungal infections account for approximately 3 million infections, which result in chronic severe fungal infections globally. And almost 1.9 million patients develop an acute invasive fungal infection every year. Many of these are life-threatening. Nearly 50% mortality has been noted. It is, of course, goes without saying that they are associated with a substantial economic burden. Besides the hospitalization, the cost of medicines and drugs, all the drugs are so expensive. So it comes to, in the US alone, it comes to about $4.6 billion being spent every year only on the fungal infection. Canada infection, about 1.4 billion, and aspergillus infection, about 1.2 billion. So the three infections that we encounter commonly, and what I'm going to discuss with you all this evening, are the aspergillus, the Canada, and now we've started seeing mucor. So starting with invasive aspergillosis, this was first described in 1953. It could involve the lungs, the paranasal sinuses, and the brain. Aspergillus flavus is the predominant species, followed by Aspergillus niger. And this has happened primarily because of the widespread use of chemotherapeutic agents and immunosuppressive agents. And the mortality rate is more than 50% in the neutropenic patients. It touches about 90% in the hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients. The clinical features of aspergillosis are very, very non-specific. They could be like any other bacterial or even sometimes a viral infection. They could just be a fever which is not responding to antibiotics. There could be signs of nosocomial pneumonia. But when it gets complicated, there could be a dissemination to the brain resulting in seizures, brain infarctions, intracranial hemorrhage, meningitis. When you get x-rays done of these patients, they mimic any other lung disease. They could be similar to a bronchopneumonia kind of a picture, interstitial pneumonia, consolidations or segmental pneumonias, or they could be like lung masses, like pulmonary nodules, 
cavitatory lesions, pleural effusion. So anything and everything can be seen when you have a fungal infection. The classical chest CT sign that has been described for invasive aspergillosis is called the halos sign. They're basically nodular lesions with GGO around it. So the halo starts to reduce. The nodule goes on increasing in size, finally developing a cavitation and what is called an air crescent. But that too, please remember that this is seen now more with pulmonary mucormycosis than with invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. And the presence of nodules and a halo sign are characteristic of angio invasion and are typically seen in patients who are neutropenic, severely neutropenic, in fact. These are the radiographic abnormalities that you can see on the CD scan also. Pulmonary nodules, interstitial pattern, consolidation, GGOs. So as I said, looking at these uh, x-rays or CT scans, it doesn't give you, it only gives you an indication that the, you may be dealing with a fungal infection, but there's no definite clear-cut pattern that is associated with it. In fact, if uh, you're very skeptical of the radiation, then you could even use MRI. The images of the MRI are able to indicate towards a fungal infection to some extent. So to reach diagnosis, you need the conventional microbiological tools. So the first step is to do a direct microscopy, a KOH stick, which may give you a diagnosis in less than an hour. Cultures with aspergillus are usually time consuming. They require sometimes even up to 21 days, that is three weeks. And then they fail to differentiate between colonizers and infective organisms. When you do the histopathology, Aspergillus shares its structure with so many other uh, organisms like Fusarium, Acrimonium, Sclerosporium, and the immunohistochemical staining also has cross-reactivity. So every test that can be used for identification of um, Aspergillus, there are certain limitations. Therefore, these non-culture-based diagnosis, uh, non-culture-based techniques, technologies have actually been developed over the years in which galactomannan is the most prominent one, which could be measured using the ELISA or the RIA or the latex agglutination or sandwich ELISA. These are all the ways in which the galactomannan can be tested. Then there are other metabolites, oblique antigens that can be used like the D-mannitol or the 1,3-BRD glucan. And of course, then the PCR that we've started resorting to very often now. So, galactomannan is basically a cell wall polysaccharide, which is specific not only to aspergillus species, but also to penicillium, couple of other species, and histoplasma. It is an exoantigen that can be detected in serum, bronchiolular lavage, or even the CSF. The Platelia galactomannan assay has been approved by the US FDA for serum as well as for bronchiolular lavage. Actually, in some patients, the galactomannan antigen can be detected in the serum even before the presence of clinical signs or symptoms of invasive aspergillosis. These are all, of course, emerged from st ongoing studies where they were repeatedly sending the galactomannan levels to see how well they correlate with an active infection. But we need to remember that most of these studies have been conducted in immunocompromised patients. And the overall sensitivity and specificity has varied depending on the cutoff levels. So when the cutoff level of 0.5 was taken, for the serum galactomannan, then the sensitivity was 78% and specificity 85%. You increase the cutoff value to 1, the sensitivity goes down to 71 and specificity increases to 90. And increase the cutoff value to 1.5, then the sensitivity goes down further to 63% and specificity increases to 93%. Galactomannan can also be checked in the bronchiolular lavage. It detects the fungal antigens even when the organism does not grow in the culture. Again, the cutoff values have uh, vary from uh, study to study. So when you keep an ODI of more than 0.8, then the sensitivity is 86 and specificity 91%. You reduce the ODI to 0.5, the sensitivity increases to 93% and specificity goes down to 87%. US FDA considers an ODI of more than 0.5 to be positive. The positive predictive value and the negative predictive value were 100% when BAL testing was combined with high resolution CD scan. But galactomannan has major, major limitations. 
and the first and the foremost limitation that i want to mention here is that if a patient is on piperacillin tazobactam or a moxiclav then there's a very high likelihood that it will result in a false positive test also because of certain autoimmune phenomena allergenic hemopoietic stem cell transplant patients new needs cotton contamination other fungi like fusarium penicillium histoplasmosis cyclophosphamide therapy they all can result in falsely positive galactaminin test so that huge limitation it could be falsely negative if the patient is already on a prophylactic or empiric uh, mold active uh, agent if the anti aspergillus antibodies are present or it's only a locally invasive infection and will also depend on the frequency of sampling and the threshold that is being used the other agent that we often want to test now recently is the 13 beta d glucan this is also a fungal cell wall component it's used as both a screening tool and a single use diagnostic for patients with suspected invasive fungal infection it's a pan fungal antigen found in many organisms including candida pneumocystis multiple filamentous fungi aspergillus fusarium and even acrimonium so notable exceptions are cryptococcus and mucorails and blastomycosis dermatitis in the yeast phase so when you look for mucormycosis then beta d glucan galactaminin should be negative and you think of mucormycosis similarly for cryptococcus also they should be negative but if it is positive you could be dealing with candida you could be dealing with aspergillus you could be dealing with pneumocystis fusarium or acrimonium again the sensitivity and specificity of this varies significantly with the cutoff values and the various studies that are being conducted we need to remember that this is not specific for aspergillus species it can be positive in patients with a variety of invasive fungal infections it could even be positive if there's a hemodialysis going on with cellulose membranes use of cellulose filters for iv administration can result in a falsely positive beta d glucan test then gauze packing of serosal surfaces can cause patients receiving iv ig iv albumin intravenous amoxiclav or piptazo and then blood stream infections with certain bacteria such as pseudomonas could also result in a falsely positive beta d glucan then of course as i said we moved on to pcrs for most of the organisms now it's not uncommon for us to be sending that biofire upper respiratory panel lower respiratory panel to look at the pcr which gives you a report within 4 to 6 hours you don't have to wait for the cultures anymore now and you could start the antibiotic or the antifungals and then there are these manan and anti manan antibodies also that you could test so pcr is performed on respiratory samples for example like um, the sputum or the bal the target sequences vary widely but most often include ribosomal genes or internal transcribed spacer reg regions transient presence of conodia in the respiratory tract may result in a false positive test they are not used widely in clinical practice the sensitivity is anything between 33 to 100% for invasive aspergillosis and specificity varies manan and anti manan antibodies are used exclusively to diagnose invasive fungal infections due to the presence of m in the cell walls sorry diagnostic values and cutoff values vary between studies combining n and m sorry manan and anti manan antibodies provides the best values m assays have a high rate of false positives and negatives required sequential monitoring and of course they're still in the stage of development but if at all you have to use both of them together manan in the manan as the antigen and anti manan antibodies as this then there are certain novel biomarkers which are still under uh, evaluation and study they are the detection of volatile organic compounds in the breath of patients suffering with aspergillosis there's a pan fungal serum disaccharide that is being evaluated and also a galactofurinase specific anti aspergillus fumigatus monoclonal antibody in a lateral flow immunodiagnostic device so all these tests if you see have significant limitation galactaminin sensitivity specificity varies depending on the odi pcr is still under experimentation only available for research 
and academic purposes, not for clinical purposes as much. Bal cultures take time to come, and the, of course, varying specificity and sensitivity. Histopathology, there can always be a problem, cross reactions. Therefore, when you're dealing with aspergillosis or even thinking of, about aspergillosis, you need to have a very high index of suspicion. So you need to keep various risk factors in mind. The classical risk factors is for an invasive pulmonary aspergillosis are that of an immunocompromised host, like a prolonged neutropenia, transplantation, post-transplant patients. It's highest seen in patients with lung transplant or hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Then prolonged, that is more than three weeks, and high-dose corticosteroid therapy that we've recently seen in many of these COVID patients who were receiving High dose corticosteroid therapy, they landed up with aspergillosis. In fact, in so many cases, we had to give empirical antifungal therapy because they were on high dose corticosteroids as a part of their uh, management for COVID. Then, hematological malignancies risk is highest with leukemia, patients who are on chemotherapy, advanced AIDS, and chronic granulomatous diseases. These are the situations where you would classically think of. Um, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. But what are the diseases that we come across in our daily routine practice? They are the chronic lung diseases and critically ill ICU patients. They're immunocompetent. Yet, this subgroup of patients, these two subgroups of patients are also very vulnerable to catching fungal infections. For chronic lung diseases, this happens primarily because of the structural changes in the lung architecture. Invariably, COPD patients, ILD patients are on prolonged use of corticosteroids require frequent hospitalization, receive broad-spectrum antibiotics, undergo various invasive procedures. Then there are certain mucosal lesions and impaired mucociliary clearance that increases the susceptibility. Comorbid illnesses like diabetes, alcoholism, malnutrition further worsen the situation. And then abnormalities or deficiencies in surfactant proteins, alveolar macrophages, and toll like receptors make the patient more susceptible to a fungal infection. The typically ICU patients that we see, they are the ones who are on systemic corticosteroid therapies, non-hematological malignancies, patients with chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, diabetes mellitus, near drowning, influenza, and now COVID also. So this is the classical scenario or setting for the patients to be developing an invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. So the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer the EORTC group, they've actually come out with a diagnostic criteria because most of these, as I said, most of the, diag the diagnostic modalities have significant limitation. So they've come out with this diagnostic criteria where it is said to be a confirmed pulmonary aspergillosis or invasive fungal infection. If you're able to provide a microscopic analysis positive on sterile material, Supposing you've got a CSF done, CSF is turning out to be positive, then you know it is 100%. Plural fluid taken in aseptic fashion turning out to be fungal positive is considered to be confirmatory of an, inf um, of an um, invasive aspergillosis. So you have, or you have to have a histopathological or a cytopathological evidence or a specimen obtained by fine needle aspiration or a sterile biopsy in which hyphae are seen accompanied by evidence of associated tissue damage. This is also very important. Just isolation is not important, but tissue damage also has to be there to label it as a confirmed case of invasive aspergillosis. Otherwise, you could label it as a probable invasive aspergillosis if you have all the three of the following criteria, of which host factors, there has to be a recent history of neutropenia, post-allogenic stem cell transplant, prolonged use of corticosteroids, treatment with other recognized T-cell immunosuppressants, inherited severe immunodeficiency states, clinical features of dense, well-circumscribed lesions, air crescent sign or a cavity on a CT scan, or, I mean, sorry, along with that, there has to be a direct test on sputum, bowel, bronchial brushing, indicating the presence of fungal elements or culture recovery of aspergillosis, or an indirect test like a galactomannan being positive, which where you would consider it to be a probable infection. And possible infection would be if there is presence of host factors, clinical factors, so out of these three, two are present, 
but the microbiology is not present. The third criteria, it does not, is not fulfilled. So first two are present, you would label it as possible invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. But please remember, this criteria applies only to patients with hematological malignancies, hematological patients. What about the ICU patients? It has been extrapolated and has been labeled as putative or an aspergillus, sorry, proven putative or a respiratory tract colonization. For it to be proven is the same as the confirmed invasive aspergillosis according to the EORTC MSG criteria, which I just mentioned, where it has to be an aseptic collection of the sample, which not only grows aspergillus, but also shows tissue invasion to confirm it as invasive aspergillosis. It could be called putative if there was an aspergillus positive lower respiratory tract culture along with the compatible signs and symptoms, clinical features, along with medical imaging, and then classical risk factors, or at least a semi-quantitative aspergillus being positive for culture, uh, on culture of bowel without bacterial growth. So it has to be a pure culture where they're able to show branching hyphae. Only then would you label it as invasive aspergillosis. Otherwise, you would only call it an aspergillus respiratory tract colonization. So in hematological malignancies or immunocompromised patients, galactomenin was also included in the diagnostic criteria. Whereas here, galactomenin has not been included. But then there's a study which says that if they were to include galactomenin in this entire scheme algorithm, then there's a possibility that it may just improve the diagnostic sensitivity for IPA in ICU patients. Another clinical manifestation of aspergillosis could be in the form of invasive tracheobronchial aspergillosis. There are very few case reports that have been mentioned. We have had the fortune of seeing one of one such patient in recent times. Nothing to do with COVID here. This is a patient who would come in with breathlessness and an strider which was persistent. We did his bronchoscopy. The entire trachea was narrowed. Nearer to carina, there was a greater narrowing. We thought maybe there's a compression from outside, but the CD scan did not show any extensic compression. It was just the thickening of the tracheal wall that was visible. We took FNACs from there, biopsies from there. They all confirmed aspergillosis, treated the patient with voriconazole for three months, and the trachea has come back to its normal shape. The, the lumen of trachea has widened, and patient symptoms have settled completely. This is a recent critical care update which has been published by Dr. Subhash Todi, Dhruv Chaudhary, Deepak Govil, and Dr. S.B. Deekshit. We've had the fortune of writing this fungal pneumonia chapter. Me and my colleague, Dr. Amna Mubashir, have written this chapter in post-COVID times, how does fungal pneumonia manifest? So, <clears throat> in the, so this has become a different entity altogether, huh? please. So super infections, particularly reports about secondary fungal infections are on the rise, and we know that we're all seeing it in day-to-day -day practice. SARS-CoV-2 invasion results in the release of danger-associated molecule patterns, that is the DAMPs, that act as endogenous signals that exacerbate the immune and inflammatory response leading to lung injury and are known to play a central role in the pathogenesis of fungal diseases. It also has collateral effects of host recognition pathways required for the activation of antiviral immunity, may contribute to a highly permissive inflammatory environment that favors fungal pathogenesis. So a new terminology has appeared. This is called the COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis, CAPA. The occurrence ranges from 0.7 to 7.7% .7 in general patients, up till 39% in ICU patients, and up till 30% in those who are on mechanical ventilator. The risk factors for CAPA include Patients staying in the ICU, especially if they are mechanically ventilated, a prolonged hospital stay patient, patient who's being given steroid dosages, especially high dosages of steroids, use of tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 agent. IL-6 is actually involved in the defense mechanism against aspergillosis. So if you neutralize that, then the chance of the, um, an aspergillus developing are very high. Prolonged neutropenia, COPD, hematopoietic stem cell transplant or solid organ transplant recipients developing COVID and patients with immunodeficiencies developing COVID would be more prone. 
again like the previous uh, definitions proven probable and possible we have similar definitions for kappa as well which have been proposed so proven kappa would be a patient with pulmonary or tracheobronchial infection which has been proven by histopathological or direct microscopic detection or both of fungal elements that are morph morphologically consistent with aspergillosis showing invasive growth into the tissues or aspergillus recovered by culture or detected by microscopy on histology slides so that means there is an invasion that is very important here or by pcr that was obtained by a sterile aspiration like from csf or pleural fluid or acidic fluid for that matter or biopsy from a pulmonary site this is the proven kappa probable kappa would be the bronchoscopic visualization of ulcerations nodules pseudo membrane formation plaque eschar in fact even pseudo tumor formation in one of our patients we had the right upper lobe completely blocked as though there's a growth there when we took biopsies from there initially we also got carried away that maybe the patient has not developed a malignancy but when we took biopsies it was all aspergillus three months treated down the line repeated bronchoscopy that bronchus which was completely occluded opened up so nice and clear and along with that there is radiological evidence of pulmonary infiltrates nodules cavitating infiltrates which are very important and cannot be attributable to any other illness and then you have the possible kappa which is uh, requires pulmonary infiltrates on nodules preferably documented on the chest ct or cavitating infiltrates in combination with mycological evidence for example microscopy culture galactomannan alone or in combination obtained via non bronchoscopic lavage so the classical diagnostic criteria would be a patient with severe covid-19 pneumonia in the icu with radiological features suggestive of aspergillosis with more than two of the following criteria like visualization of the bronchoscopic features detection of galactomannan in serum bowel fluid endotracheal aspirate culture positive aspergillus species or a bdd glucan positive in serum or pcr for aspergillus positive in blood or respiratory samples this is where you would label the patient as kappa now treatment for aspergillosis like any other infection should be started promptly the early treatment initiation according to the first line therapy at the stage of the possible infection has been reported to be associated with improved outcomes and that goes without saying for any infection the earlier you start the better the outcome would be non neutropenic patients with invasive aspergillosis were less likely to show symptoms therefore a preemptive approach based on microbiological markers has been useful the the gold standard treatment and the first line therapy for proven invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is voriconazole which is given as iv 6 mg per kg every 12 hours and first day for 4 mg sir nagya sir han ji can we can we have a break here if you or you want to continue till the end maybe you can ask dr shastri sir to comment on whatever has gone uh, so far so i am just finishing aspergillosis oh, in the next oh, three okay. or four sites okay okay so so voriconazole would be the drug of choice here followed by amphotericin b if you're giving empirical or preemptive therapy then you would consider liposomal amfo b as the first drug of choice and if there is a prophylaxis that is required then posaconazole is the recommended drug actually if you look at the various other syndromes or various other aspergillus infections in the body like in the sinuses tracheobronchial cns heart endocarditis osteomyelitis septic arthritis treatment remains the same for all of these voriconazole is the first drug of choice followed by liposomal amfo b as the alternative and as salvage therapy which we'll just discuss subsequently so the only difference would be that if there's a patient with an eye infection like end of thalmatis and keratitis you may want to give iv or oral voriconazole along with intravitreal amphotericin b so we recently had a patient with of course this was an um, an invasive um, mucormycosis where we've had to give intravitreal amphotericin b so voriconazole is the drug of choice like lipid amp formulation of amfo b the second option and amfo the conventional amphotericin b deoxycholate should be reserved for resource limited settings like us but what is happening is that with 
passing of time and usage of all these medicines, there's a voriconazole resistance that has started to appear. And it has increased in frequency over the last decades. These are the countries where it has been reported from. In India, it was detected for the first time in 2008. There are various mechanisms of resistance. They're basically colonizing the pulmonary cavity, asexual reproduction, resulting in abundant spores, resulting in multiple genetic changes that happen during the infection. The two primary routes are patient-acquired resistance and environmental resistance that the patient can develop breakthrough infections while they are on triazoles. There's also some degree of azole cross-resistance. Itraconazole resistance is about 8%. 65% were also resistant to voriconazole and 74% were resistant to posaconazole. So how do you manage these patients who have azole resistance or where you can't use azole? Obviously, the choice would be to move away from azoles to a liposomal amphoby or a combination of voriconazole and an echinocantin. The alternative newer azoles that are available are isavuconazole and posaconazole. Isavuconazole has long half-life, better side effect profile than voriconazole. It has been shown to be non-inferior to voriconazole and recently approved for invasive aspergillosis. It is recommended as an alternative primarily because of lack of clinical experience. Otherwise, it is not inferior to it. Posaconazole is being posted as a second-line therapy for patients who fail therapy with uh, voriconazole or amphobi. And when you compare it with amphobi, then it has a better response rate in the non-neutropenic patients with a better 30-day survival rate. But of course, it lacks major randomized trials. So the salvage therapy would include changing the class of antifungal agent, tapering the reverse or reversal of the underlying immunosuppression when feasible, and surgical resection of the necrotic lesions in selected cases. There's an additional antifungal agent may be added to the current therapy or combination of antifungal drugs from different classes other than those in the initial regime may be used. Duration of therapy would be minimum of 6 to 12 weeks in the non-immunocompromised patients. In immunocompromised patients, therapy could continue throughout the period of immunosuppression and until the lesions have resolved completely. And galactomenin is not a reliable marker for stopping therapy. Isolation of aspergillus in critically ill patients is associated with a very high mortality, as I said at the beginning. It could range from anything between 59 to 95%. The three factors that are associated with poor prognosis are disseminated infection, co-infection, and presence of bacterial pneumonia and the like. These patients would definitely have a higher mortality touching almost 78%. This is where I would take a break and request Dr. Shastri to come in. Thank you, sir, uh, for the wonderful slides so far and the details. Uh, Dr. Shastri, sir, may I request you to kind of, uh, you know, give your ex ex uh, comments, sir, on the vast experience you have on fungal infections and everybody knowing that uh, you have a special interest in this area for all our audience. Please, sir, your uh, comments, sir, on whatever has been covered so far. Thank you, sir. Hello, Yes, Dr. Shachi, can you please come in? Yeah, me? Yeah, yes, sir. Please, sir, your, your comments, sir, from what has been covered so far, from your vast experience that you have with fungal infections and... Aspergillus is... Uh, or... Yeah, aspergillus. No, yes, I'll confine yes. myself to aspergillus for the moment. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to tell that aspergillus is, uh, until some years back, let us say 10 years back, was an exotic fungal infection which we never thought that we would be seeing regularly in the intensive care unit until we became sensitized that yes intensive care unit patients form a definite risk group for developing fungal infections the first was that we came across was uh, right up uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Nangya's uh, uh, alley which was a COPD uh, patient the COPD patients are on fairly long-term steroids and whenever we do when they get intubated then we go ahead and do a ball in them and in ball we tend to get um, aspergillus now i want to make this very clear to all the listeners who are listening to me that at when we talk about uh, the classifications of viruses the proven probable and uh, possible we need to be aware of the fact that the respiratory sexual whether they are coming from bile or whether they are coming from the endotracheal aspirate, they do not formulate what is called a sterile. 
respiratory tract is not a sterile site so that is why even if you grow uh, aspergillus from a bulk specimen that doesn't mean that you have got a proven diagnosis of aspergillosis but yes for the sake of cleaning uh, management of these patients. If the species bile specimen does grow aspergillus, the bile specimen does have a galactomenin positive, and if it is consistent with the radiological finding, you can make a reasonable assumption that you have hit across a uh, probable as uh, aspergillus infections, and there is invasion of aspergillosis in the uh, in the uh, in the tissue as well as maybe in the bloodstream. Having said that, we if you do not do uh, galactomenin in the serum of this, in the blood of these patients, because uh, all these patients are immunocompetent patients to a certain extent. And uh, when the neutrophils are there present in abundant quantity in the blood, then the galactomenin is devoured by the uh, by the neutrophils. And that is why, generally speaking, in any immunocompetent patients, uh, bal uh, serum galactomenin is number one always negative and number two of very dubious value and uh, it should not be done at all yes to an extent you can make a case of bulk electromagnet to be there and again i would slightly differ from uh, dr Mulangia in this sense that if you have done bulk electromagnet a single value does not uh, imply anything maybe if two two values are done maybe a week apart or so and if they are showing a positive value and this positive value would be anything about 0.5 optical density units then you can be uh, reasonably sure that you are dealing with an aspergillus infection. Having said that, uh, I told in the beginning that the intensive care unit patients by themselves have now been sort of included in the ERTC um, uh, MSD criteria as uh, sort of immunocompetent come immunosuppressed patients. And lately, both the chronic kidney disease patients who are on regular hemodialysis and chronic liver disease patients have been included as one of the risk factors, as Dr. Nangya has also mentioned. The uh, If you are interested in research activities, then I'll direct you to two articles, which one of them has been mentioned by Dr. Nangya, which was DEPO. The other uh, research article is uh, by Blot. They have classified as uh, putative or possible fungal infections in COPD patients. And in COPD patients, if you are deal if you are studying aspergillus inf infections, then your inclusion criteria have to be based upon the inclusion criteria that have been mentioned in these two articles. And then only probably your paper would be having a substantive value. Uh, so so much so about the aspergillus infections. Yes, the incidence of aspergillus infection has become. Uh, really decently high in the recent times, more so because of the presence of uh, viral infections that we have come. We have been aware of the uh, influenza associated in, uh, aspergillus, and that was reported widely uh, in the H1N1 epidemic. Uh, and similarly, in the COVID epidemic also, we have been reporting fairly high incidence of COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis also. And the COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis, the diagnosis was very difficult because um, uh, bronchoscopy was considered as an aerosol producing uh, procedure. And that is why it is in the first uh, uh, first uh, surge of the epidemic, we did not do too many bronchoscopies. That's why the numbers were not too many. But as the second wave came in and as we became more bold and in managing these patients, quite a lot of the patients in the second uh, surge of the epidemic were subjected to bile, of course, with adequate precautions. Uh, because by that time we had realized that aspergillus, aspergillus case reports have come in the in the international literature so we had become aware of the fact that aspergillus is is possible in covid associated patients and that is why we made attempts to diagnose this patient having said that i must tell you what all diagnosis that we made in these patients with those subject at least in the beginning of this year it was december january february of this year the diagnosis of aspergillus was made almost as in hindsight when these patients uh, developed pneumothorax and then they had to be sent for the operation theater for a possible decortication. And when the sample was sent to the histopathology, we got invasive uh, aspergillosis. And then by the time we initiated the therapy, most of these patients died. So that was the bad news. And that is why nowadays we have we are more um, uh, aggressive in doing the bronco alveolar lavage in these patients and making uh, early diagnosis because we know that an early diagnosis will go a long way in treating these patients. As far as the treatment is concerned, 
that yes, vericonazole is the drug of choice. The alternative drug that we can give in this patient is liposomal amphotericin B in the usual doses. Fusaconazole and isafiaconazole uh, both have been uh, tried in these patients. Uh, and especially now in uh, the when the tablets are become available of both uh, uh, isafiaconazole and fusaconazole, these tablets have a wonderful bioavailability and their results are as good as, if not better than, uh, Vericonazole. So, in, uh, but they require that the patients have to take the tablets as a whole and not to be chewed. And especially in our patients in intensive care unit who have got a residue feeding going on, we, we can't crush these tablets and give to them. And that is why the only alternative available to us is only posaconazole syrup and isabiconazole uh, cannot be given to this patient. So that is so much about aspergillus. A lot of interest has come around COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillus. Lots of articles have come out. A lot of uh, case reports have been uh, uh, published, not only in uh, international journals, but also in Indian journals. And I'm sure uh, a lot of our colleagues must have published some papers. I'm in the process, but uh, I've, I've, as yet not published, so I can't say that. Thank you, Tapesh. I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, sir, for the... Yeah. Tapesh, hand uh, over to you. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful uh, sharing of your experience and the insight into aspergillosis, which is coming up more and more, and uh, we are trying to diagnose it more and more, but it still remains underdiagnosed because of the diagnostic problems, galactomen being uh, false positive in many uh, conditions, but definitely a bulk galactomen in more than 0.5 is helpful, and uh, it can be used to follow up these patients also. One thing I probably I missed it, I do not know, is the CT's halo sign of aspergillosis, which is uh, seen in around 70% of the patients of aspergillosis, which can be a good pointer, which is not diagnostic, but uh, given all the circumstances, the uh, halo sign seen on CT is highly suggestive of aspergillosis, and you get a reverse halo sign in mucor, which I'm sure Dr. Nagya will speak about in the coming slides. And uh, apart from that, uh, piperacillin tazobactam is a very important cause of false positive galactomenin, as pointed out by Dr. Uh, Nagia and uh, uh, you know the diagnosis of aspergillosis in a patient who's on the ventilator is uh, sometimes difficult because it uh, comes up in the background of uh, already present infiltrates. So it is not so easy, and you may not uh, get uh, too many signs and symptoms because it is uh, somewhat insidious. And another thing to remember is that uh, aspergillosis is angio-invasive, and from the lungs it can go into your brain. Uh, your brain vessels cause uh, brain hemorrhage, uh, aneurysms, etc., uh, etc., et and it can disseminate throughout the body. And uh, I'm not sure whether a PCR is a, a really good test because uh, different labs are doing it differently. Though it has been recommended that if your, uh, you know, your galactomenin and your PCR both are negative in bal, then uh, you are unlikely to be dealing with the uh, aspergillosis. But then the way the PCR is done is very important. And uh, other than that, if uh, your immunocompromised patient shows bal uh, aspergillosis positive, then it should be taken as positive. Though we have talked about contamination because the airways get colonized and they can be contaminated, and just getting uh, a, a sample, a respiratory sample positive for uh, your aspergillosis does not mean that the patient is suffering from pulmonary aspergillosis, but in an immunocompromised patient, you can take it as positive. So uh, that's all uh, I think about aspergillosis and uh, whatever we have covered so far so nicely by Dr. Nagya sir and the comments from Dr. Shatri sir. So I hand it over to you Dr. Nagya sir for your uh, further uh, session. Right. So moving on to the next fungal infection that we encounter very often, that is Canada. Canada from the U.S. hospitals has been reported as the fourth most common cause of bloodstream infections, accounting for a 40% crude mortality. In India, we are no less, no, no way behind the Western figures. Even in India, is the fourth most common cause of bloodstream infections. It's the most common in ICUs. Few studies have reported up to 18% candidemia that they have seen. It increases the mortality rate by 20 to 50%. And the nosocomial candidiasis are associated with a crude mortality rate of over 60%. There's been an 11-fold increase in the late 1980s and 18-fold increase between 1990 and 95, though we don't have very clear data, but yes, we all know that it's on the rise. And it's the non-albicans species which are more common now. Canada tropicalis leading the show, followed by albicans, parapsilosis, glabrata, and now oris. Glabrata is fluconazole resistant. Therefore, 
it is also resistant to all azole, so you need to be careful when you're dealing with glabrata. Prusai is inherently resistant to fluconazole, but sensitive to oriconazole. And Canada lucitani or hemolunai is resistant to amphotericin. So these are basic things that we need to remember. Oris, the incidence of which is about 5.7%, 5.3%, is amongst the top five Canada species that is being isolated now. We've encountered quite a bit of Canada Oris in the COVID times. It's a multi drug resistant yeast and often misidentified because it looks very similar to uh, Canada Hemolunae. It has been reported to cause cutaneous and invasive infections. Both is associated with a very high mortality. It is mainly thermotolerant and salt tolerant, which make it difficult to identify and eliminate from the body. And then, of course, there's a huge biofilm formation that makes the drugs difficult to penetrate and helps in this bug developing resistance. The resistance to fluconazole is more than 90%, to voriconazole is about 50%, amphobia is about 30%, and echinocandins is about 7 to 10%. The risk factors for um, Canada infection include broad, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, presence of a central venous catheter, pneumonia, renal failure. These are the four most common risk factors that predispose an individual or a patient developing Canada infection. Followed by use of steroid therapy, ARDS, COPD, surgery of uh, GI tract, hepatobiliary or pancreatic in prior 30 days. Parental nutrition is very, very common uh, source of resulting in Canada infection and malignancies. So the diagnostic tests that are used Again, include the conventional microbiological methods of uh, microscopy, culture, identification, susceptibility testing, then histopathological examination. The sensitivity of the automated blood culture system is something between 55 to 70 percent, according to the literature. In our country, it's probably even lesser than that. There are newer techniques that have been introduced, which include the fluorescent in situ hybridization, that is, fish, and the Maltidoff. Maldorf, the results are available faster, more reliable, and species identification also happens easily with it. Beta D glucan has been used in invasive fungal infection. This is a study again in immunocompromised patients suffering with AML or MDS, and beta D glucan had a sensitivity of 70% and specificity of 87%. A new test which has recently got approval from US FDA is the T2 Candela test which actually combines the targeted PCR with T2 magnetic resonance, that is MRR. This has been used so far for the detection of five most common bloodstream infections with Canada, like the albicans, tropicalis, parapsilosis, glabrata, and crusai. For Canada, Oris is under development. So this assay basically detects pathogens from a blood specimen within three to five hours, far more quickly than the blood cultures. The assay breaks the yeast cells apart, releases DNA, and copies the target DNA and detects the amplified DNA using magnetic resonance technology. This is the article which uh, the research that was conducted, where they found that the overall sensitivity of this test was about 91%, and the negative predictive value ranged from 95, 99 to 99%. Then again, even for this, combining Manon and anti Manon antibodies gives encouraging results. PCR is uh, the new upcoming thing. It allows a rapid diagnosis. As little as 10 to 100 FG of genomic DMA is equal to fewer than 10 to 100 quinidia per ml. They can be detected. Detection of candida DNA or RNA can be done directly from clinical specimens. However, fungal DNA or RNA detection requires methodological standardization. There has been a recent prospective trial of real-time PCR, which actually showed that uh, 9 out of 11 samples considered as proven candidiasis were PCR positive. 3 out of 13 probable invasive candidiasis samples were positive, but none of the 491 unlikely invasive candidiasis samples were positive. So again, if you look at the sensitivity and specificity of all these tests that I just mentioned, they have significant limitations and um, the turnaround time may be higher but the diagnostic value is much lesser. And of course, we know that for any infection, 
treatment should be started promptly otherwise would result in a significantly high mortality and that's also true for canada infection where a delay in therapy would result in a much higher mortality therefore we need to depend on certain canada prediction rules based on certain risk factors like the prolonged use of antibacterial antibiotics presence of a central venous catheter parenteral nutrition prolonged icu stay surgery that has been especially transecting the gut wall from where the gut is actually colonized with canada so if there's a surgery which is involving the transection of the gut that would result in liberation and the the spread of canada from the gut and colonization by canada of multiple non sterile sites in a patient who's continuing to run fever or rising counts not coming under control these are the risk factors that you would think of while thinking that yes this patient may be uh, suffering with candidemia then there is this predictive rule of where uh, mechanical ventilation presence of central venous catheter broad spectrum antibiotics plus an additional risk factor like ppn dialysis major surgery pancreatitis steroids and other immunosuppression agents that have been used would result in a higher probability of the patient having a candidemia then you have this ostrisky zischner rule where icu stay for at least 4 days plus antibiotic use plus cvc plus any of these factors that i just mentioned yet another score similar score which has a significant predictive value so what do you do with all these so basically there is a colonization index the canada score the predictive value if any of these are positive you can actually start the patient on empirical antifungal therapy the chances are that you may be right but if you are wrong if the cultures turn out to be negative subsequently you could definitely deescalate the therapy or, de or stop the therapy that was started as an empirical therapy now which antifungal agent to choose this was a consensus statement on the management of invasive candidiasis and in icus in the asia pacific region which i was also a part of this committee and uh, they were formulated way back in 2009 and i'm happy to share with you that these rules still hold true even in the current scenario so the choice of agent that you use would depend upon factors like has the patient been recently exposed to azoles what about the regional susceptibility patterns what kind of candida you are growing in your cultures comorbidities and underlying disorders severity of illness clinical evidence to suggest whether there is involvement of the cns cardiac valves liver spleen or kidneys or history of intolerance to any of the antifungal agent and then whether you're using it as a prophylaxis preemptive therapy empirical therapy or a targeted therapy if it is already proven so fluconazole remains the standard of primary therapy for selected patients who have proven and probable invasive candidiasis with no previous history of azole exposure illness is mild to moderate patient is hemodynamically stable not very sick looking and the chance of candida glabrata are not very high it is also the drug of choice for patients who have suspected genito urinary candidiasis uti especially because of its excellent urinary penetration it's a reasonable step down therapy for patients who are improving on more aggressive initial antifungal therapy like canocandin or an amphobi that might have been started and who are infected with a susceptible organism who are ready for transition to oral therapy voriconazole and posaconazole are other alternatives that we have Voriconazole especially has broad activity against Candida cruzi and Candida glabrata most of them but it has several disadvantages of unpredictable pharmacokinetics more drug interactions paucity of clinical data to support its use amongst patients who have invasive candidiasis and it is to be avoided in patients with a liver disease then come the acinocandins there are three FDA approved acinocandins casufungin mycofungin and androlafungin three large randomized control trials on the basis of which these drugs have got their approval they have a very broad spectrum antibody activity against all species favorable safety profile and few drug interaction and they basically indicated in a patient with moderate to severe illness who has had a recent exposure azo the duration of therapy for candidemia without persisting fungemia or metastatic complications is about 2 weeks after documented clearance of candida from the blood stream resolution of symptoms attributable to candidemia and resolution of neutropenia so what is very important is to deescalate the therapy the 
transition from an acanocandin to fluconazole should begin usually around the fifth or the seventh day. Once the patient has achieved clinical stability, the isolates are susceptible to fluconazole and they are negative repeat blood cultures following initiation of the antifungal therapy. If you're dealing with a candida gabbrata, then you could transit to a high dose of fluconazole of 800 mg daily or vodiconazole 200 to 300 mg twice daily in patients where it is fluconazole susceptible or vodiconazole susceptible isolates. If it is candida cruci, then you step down to vodiconazole as a therapy. Empirical therapy has also been advised by the IDSA guidelines of 2016 in patients with high risk factors for invasive candidiasis and no other known cause of fever. And this also should be started as early as possible. But again, it says you must de-escalate quickly. So IDSA says in five to seven days, once the patient has stabilized, ECMID says about 10 days overall, and you could de-escalate. What about prophylaxis? Again, prophylaxis can also be used in patients in the ICU settings, if there's a high risk patient with a high rate of invasive candidiasis of more than 5% in that particular ICU. And you could use any of the two drugs, either a fluconazole or an akinocandin for prophylaxis. Daily bathing of ICU patients with chlorhexidine has also been shown to reduce the incidence of bloodstream infections, including candidemia and others. So if the patient has a central venous catheter, should be removed in a non-neutropenic patient, the classical patient that we see in the ICU or not, is a major question that comes to your mind. So it should actually be removed as early as possible in the course of candidemia when the source is presumed to be the central line and the catheter can be removed safely. Of course, it has to be individualized if it's a long-term catheter or, you know, like a, a chemoport or something, then maybe you could do a salvage therapy or continue with the therapy and salvage the catheter. But if it is removable, you can get another line, then best is to remove it always. Lots of patients in the ICU, when you send their urine sample, turn out to be Canada positive on the culture. So are all of them to be treated? Well, certainly not. Treatment with antifungal agents is not recommended unless the patient belongs to a high-risk group like neutropenia, low birth weight, or patients are undergoing a urological manipulation. Only then, otherwise not. Otherwise, you have to basically eliminate the predisposing factor such as the indwelling catheter, whenever it is feasible. And the drugs that are recommended for proven UTIs with frank signs and symptoms with Canada growing in the urine culture are amphotericin B and fluconazole. Vodiconazole does not have a good penetration. Akinocandins do not penetrate into the urinary tract. Let's take a break here and ask Dr. Shasti for his comments. Yes. Thank you, sir, for your uh, uh, valuable slides on... Canada and the inputs. Uh, Dr. Shastri, sir, may I request you for your opinion and your comments on Canada, sir, which is so common and we see it all the time. Uh, Dr. Shastri, sir, uh, can you please come in? Okay. So I'll, uh, while Dr. Shastri is coming in, I'll just uh, like to update a few things on uh, Canada. One, uh, like Dr. Nagia showed, please do not treat urinary samples positive for Canada unless uh, the two, three conditions that he mentioned are present. Then, as far as the respiratory tract is concerned, again, the same thing applies. Canada is a colonizer. If you take a sputum sample also, you get Canada. So whenever we do a bowel or send an endotracheal aspirate, you often get Canada. So please do not treat that. Canada does not cause pneumonia through the respiratory tract. In fact, Canada pneumonia does not practically occur. And uh, when Canada does occur, which is very, very rare, is through invasive candidiasis through bloodstream infection. So that is another thing we have to keep in mind. It is very, very common to see patients on fluconazole or even higher uh, antifungal anti drugs uh, when they have a respiratory tract sample. It is rampant. And I have said this many times, I say it again, please do not treat respiratory samples positive for Canada. Very rarely, if there's a heavy growth in the respiratory tract, you may get an allergic kind of a reaction and some bronchospasm, uh, some degree of tracheobronchitis. That is a very uh, rare situation. 
as a rule, do not treat respiratory tract samples. So over to Dr. Shastri, sir, for your comments on Canada, sir, uh, which is so, so common in our ICU. Sir, uh, are you able to hear, sir, Dr. Shashi, sir? Yeah, I can. Yeah, please, sir. I can. Can you I hear me? Hear you, sir. Can you just sir, summarize? Uh, we have covered the. Can I just summarize in two lines? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, about the Canada. About the yeah. Canada. Okay. Uh, Canada. Canada infections in the ICU are really a problem, unlike aspergillosis and muca, which can tend to come very rarely. Canada is a very ubiquitous in the ICU, and that is why we need to know how to deal with it. I am glad that uh, Tapesh really took pains to inform that uh, when you grow Canada from the respiratory tract and from the urine, you have to take it with a lot of caution because you tend to get colonizers from there. But how to distinguish between colonizer and true infection would be something which is a clinical judgment and depends upon the patient's conditions and the presence of risk factors that the patient might be having. So I will not deal with it. What I'll deal with is that once you grow candida from the blood, there is no going back. You are dealing with a true uh, candidemia in the blood. And uh, if, you are, if there is candida in the blood, then it has to be treated. Now, before you actually start treatment, the first thing you need to do is that if the patient is having a central line, central line needs to come out within 24 hours of you getting the report. That is the first thing that you need to do. Number two, what is the most common species that you grow in the uh, in the ICU? In India, unlike as in so many other countries, the most common fungal species, most common candida species that you come, come, come across is Candida tropicalis. And until now, in majority of the hospitals and majority of reports that we have read, the uh, resistance to fluconazole in Candida tropicalis is less than 10%. So more often than not, you might possibly get away uh, by giving fluconazole to the patient, except in those situations when the patient is hemodynamically unstable is, and is on ventilator and on vas vasopressors and all, in which case possibly you'll be better off giving an echinocandin in these patients. But when the patient, may, but by the time you grow the uh, Canada species and you get Canada tropicalis, most common in our ICUs, you can uh, de-escalate to fluconazole if it is sensitive to, uh, to fluconazole. Having said that, the other uh, species that we need to know about is Canada paracelosis. Again, Canada paracelosis has predilections towards the artificial catheters that we put in the patient. So generally, the, uh, uh, the species associated with urinary catheters or uh, central lines or diabetes or uh, dialysis catheters, they are generally Canada paracelosis. Again, Canada paracelosis cannot be treated until, until the authentic catheter or line has been removed. So that is something that we need to, to uh, come across. The third thing uh, on which I have the dubious distinction of having published an article is on Canada Oris. And Canada Oris is a relatively new phenomenon in our ICUs. And the dangerous aspect about Canada Oris is that it is very resistant. In our ICUs, it is resistant to amphicin B. It is across the board resistant to all azoles. But yes, echinocandins are uh, useful in Canada Oris. And Canada Oris generally uh, occurs in those patients who have had a prolonged stay in the intensive care unit. Other than that, there are very few risk factors that I can name offhand, but uh, patients who have stayed in the ICU for long enough, they have got lines, they are on mechanical ventilations. These are the patients who tend to grow Canada or risk. And it is likely that uh, if the patients have been on amphotericin B for some reason or the other, then Canada or risk uh, comes out as uh, uh, because uh, amphotericin B is, uh, is not useful and uh, it, uh, selects out Canada Oris and we tend to get Canada Oris in the bloodstream. Again, very difficult to treat, but uh, echinocandines have given good results. I think that's about all for Canada. We can move on to Mucor. Uh, sir, just, just one the question page. about Canada. Are we doing beta D glucan anywhere, in uh, either in Max or in Gangaram? Because that is a good test for ruling out uh, Canada. I, I did. I didn't get you. I'm sorry. Sir, are we are we doing the beta, I could the hear beta you. D glucan test for Canada either in uh, Gangaram or in Max? Because that's a good rule out. We are not doing it. In, we are not doing it. Absolutely, I would agree with you. Beta D glucan is a is a good test, uh, and not only it is good test for Canada. It is a good test for Asper. It's a pan fungal marker. It is a good test for uh, Aspergillus, uh, but not useful for Mucormycosis and Triplococcus. But for Canada, it is excellent and. Uh, I remember uh, there is a study which has come out from Apollo Chennai in which they have been able to 
show that in those patients where beta D glucon was uh, less than the cutoff value of something like 280 picogram per ml or something or 480, I can't remember exactly. Uh, and in those patients, they could de-escalate and even stop antifungal and uh, this was no effect. So it has come out from Chennai itself. Apollo Chennai people had published a study on uh, beta D glucon. There are, as of now, not more than five centers in the country which are doing beta D glucon. We have been trying to start beta D glucon for a very long time. We have not been able to do so. I can't see the reason why because we were one of the first people to start galactomenon in the in the NCR capital Delhi, and most of the Western Delhi, Northwest Delhi hospitals are sending their samples to us uh, for getting galactomenon. That is why our it is becoming cost effective for us. Why can't the same thing be done for beta D glucon is something that is beyond my uh, comprehension but i'm sure it is a matter of time by the end of this year maybe because of covid it got delayed but by, by the end of this year we should have uh, a beta d collector uh, beta d glucon in our uh, in our arometrium in available in gangaram hospital uh, but yes uh, as dr nagya has painfully told has taken painfully uh, has tried to illustrate the limitations of this there are so many limitations of this test and uh, it is user dependent also the people who are working on it they should be expert on it and that is why unless we get large volumes it will not be very cost effective these are the various factors which go into it things like wash pieces can get a positive epitetic look on value so uh, glasses and so many other things which are commonly used in our in our icu which are commonly used in the microbiology labs they can produce a false positive results these are the, some limitations of epitetic look on but i'm sure these will be ironed out in the Days to come, and it will become a standard test for all of us to do. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, one important message that sir has conveyed that if uh, you have a high index of suspicion for invasive candidiasis, and uh, you are not having any microbiological diagnosis, and if you have to cover the patient up, if he is hemodynamically unstable, kindly start with an echinocandin if possible. And then, if affordable, you can continue with the, the echinocandin or switch over uh, to uh, fluconazole uh, if your uh, your you know susceptibility is available and the Canada species is susceptible to fluconazole. The problem with fluconazole uh, is uh, one that uh, you know the, often these patients have renal failure and the pharma PKPD of fluconazole is not very well defined uh, with renal failure. There are problems and that can lead to uh, problems in the outcome when you use fluconazole vis-a-vis echinocandin. Uh, Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Nagya, sir. Thank you, G. <clears throat> so we continue with mucor, the third fungus that we encounter and the newest kid on the block. The group of invasive infections caused by filamentous fungi belong to the mucorosi family. The mucor, the rhizopus, canilabala are the most common species. They're characterized by the presence of hyphae, secrete an enzyme which is called ketone reductase, which allows them to thrive in high glucose and acidic conditions. And they are angioinvasive, resulting in the infected tissue, which is a hallmark of this disease. So all this black fungus that it has been called, it is not the fungus which is black colored. The fungus is the usual white colored only. It's the angioinvasiveness of the fungus that results in an infarction of the tissue. The, the infarcted tissue appears to be black in color. And that is why it has got this misnomer of being the black fungus. The most common risk factors for mucormycosis are diabetes mellitus, especially the presence of uncontrolled sugars with a diabetic ketoacidosis. In patients with neutropenia, patients with hematological malignancies, patients with increased serum iron or being treated with deferoxamine, immunocompromised due to hematopoietic stem cell transplant, chronic corticosteroid treatment, hemochromatosis, AIDS, these are the classical risk factors. Now, is COVID a risk factor for developing mucormycosis? I'm not sure of that. Or was it just the incidental uncontrolled blood sugars in these patients or use of steroids or tocilizumab mycosis? Or is there an inherent um, risk factor? COVID itself is acting as an inherent risk factor. I don't think we have that answer available to us. But most of the studies have been done and seeing the correlation with all these immune-compromised state basically. These are studies from India where they have linked mucormycosis with diabetes, and this seems to be quite a common phenomena in these patients. Clinically, you see about five or six presentations, starting with rhinocerebral, where it is presumed to start with the inhalation of spores into the paranasal sinuses, 
From there, it results in tissue necrosis, bilateral discharge, going into the orbit, perinasal swelling, erythema from the orbit, going into the brain, CNS involvement, cavernous sinus thrombosis, so on and so forth. Pulmonary could be a rapidly progressive infection that occurs after inhalation of the spores into the bronchioles and the alveoli. There is pneumonia with infarction and necrosis, and they can spread to contiguous structures such as the mediastinum, heart, or disseminate hematogenously to other organs. We've had a patient who had pulmonary mucormycosis, proveron bronchoscopy. In fact, the lady had come to us in post-COVID period with a right upper lobe pneumonia and mediastinal lymph nodes. We actually did the bronchoscopy and endobronchial ultrasound, guided FNA from the mediastinal lymph nodes, thinking that this would most likely be necrosis. But when we did the FNAC from the mediastinal lymph nodes, we isolated mucormycosis in the FNA sample, which we got instantly while we were doing the EBUS itself through the rows that we do for all our patients. So even before the procedure was over, we knew this is the the, uh, the mucormycosis has gone into mediastinal lymph nodes also. Then it could be disseminated in patients with severely immunocompromised state burns patients, premature infants, and those who have received defaroxamine. It could also manifest as localized infection, cutaneous infection, and gastrointestinal. It has been seen to occur in combats where um, this is an incidental cases have been reported following a tornado, tsunami, volcanic eruptions, then uh, blast injuries sustained during combat in Afghanistan in the U.S. military personnel. It has also been reported in the healthcare settings where it's a common infection site in ECG leads, adhesive tapes, contaminated intramuscular injection, and air in the hospital that could result in mucormycosis. The major underlying diseases were solid organ transplants, the diabetes mellitus, and severe prematurity. Rhinocerebral mucormycosis can result in thrombosis of the sinuses, involvement of the carotid arteries, CNS infarctions leading to hemiparesis, hemiplegia, coma, death, CNS hemorrhage, abscess, cerebritis, as well as blindness, optical nerve damage. As I just uh, shared with you earlier also, we recently had a patient with uh, rhinocerebral mucormycosis extending into the orbital area requiring intraorbital injections and could leave behind a permanent residual defect in up to 70% of the cases. We've had the opportunity to see a GI mucormycosis also with patient had presented with a bowel gangrene in the post-COVID period and was uh, uh, coming with septic shock. The other conditions would be anemia, renal failure, hematological malignancies, alcoholism, prematurity. GI mucormycosis has seen 20% of the patients with enterocolitis. We've had one patient in the post-COVID with renal mucormycosis as well, where the kidneys were infected and had to be removed. One kidney was removed. So, infarction, pilar vessel thrombosis, vasculitis, cortical and medullary necrosis, microapsis and granulomas can be seen in these patients. <clears throat> so far, 50 cases have been reported in the last two decades. I'm sure following this COVID wave, we'll have more such cases of mucormycosis also, the renal mucormycosis. The diagnosis is made by histopathological invasion that is seen. The hyphae are broad, regularly branched, but no septic. So they are aseptic. Serum, B ready, you can, and galactoponin are negative. PCR with sequencing, mild off can be used, but they are difficult culture. What is important is an early diagnosis in this also. It's important to distinguish between mucorails and aspergillus so that the treatment can be uh, can be uh, more targeted. The prognosis will depend on the rapidness of the diagnosis, site of infection, and the underlying conditions of the immune status of the patient. The clinical symptoms are elusive. Conventional techniques are often insensitive. Cultures are often negative. So this is the flow chart that has been recommended that you do a direct examination of bowel, tissue sample, biopsy, or an autopsy. And if you see broad, non-septate, ribbon-like hyphae, 90 degrees angle, then you consider them as zygomycosis or mucormycosis and treat them accordingly. The direct microscopy can further be uh, 
and you highlighted with the use of optical brightness where you're able to see the the spores even better the koh mount the high number of culture negative findings but microscopically positive findings can be explained by the fragile non separated growth of these fungi that make them easily damaged by mechanical touch <coughs> the sensitivity of the culture is not optimal the cultured fungus allows identification of susceptibility testing if it happens all the mucorails grow rapidly on most fungal culture media such as the saboras or the potato dextros and for species associated to the yarn of uh, kaningamella and rhizopus a microaerophilic environment improves the culture yield then there's something called a water culture that is uh, specifically used for mucor mycos with the the species of e a elegans and s valiformis these fungi require nutrient poor medium to sufficiently sporulate for microscopic identification species identifications of interest for a better epidemiological knowledge of mucor mycosis and maybe a value for outbreak investigation tissue diagnosis should be made with the help of the histopathological examination past staining can be used for this purpose the biopsy specimen should not be crushed or ground because the non septate hyphae are very very prone to damage growth usually occurs in 2 to 3 days unless the species are determined by examination of the fungal morphology then as i said earlier also id 32 c kit by biomere can be used for this purpose maltitoff can be used for species identification but still in the development stages so is the serology the antibody tests they're all in the development stages yet but it's very important to do certain supportive laboratory tests that include a cbc to rule out neutropenia and abg to look at the the degree of acidosis a lab sample to look for blood glucose bicarbonate levels electrolytes <clears throat> and useful to monitor homeostasis and direct correction of acidosis then iron studies may be indicated to assess the presence of iron overload as shown by high ferritin levels and a low tibc again molecular assays are under uh, development but they still lack clinical validation imaging should be used to investigate areas of suspected mucor mycosis you may see a reverse halo sign in these patients a halo sign is characteristic of angioinvasiveness but a reverse halo sign where a focal area of lung glass attenuation surrounded by a ring of consolidation has also been reported for rhino orbital cerebellar infection it's the endoscopic evaluation and tissue tract process that has to be documented smears can be taken at that time and which can be seen under the slide immediately for confirmation of diagnosis cd findings include soft tissue edema of the nasal cavity mucosa sinus mucoperiosteal thickening bone erosion orbital invasion facial soft tissue swelling and retroanterior fat type thickening so the treatment includes early diagnosis elimination of predisposing factors for infection such as hyperglycemia metabolic acidosis deferoxamine administration immunosuppressive drugs neutropenia all this needs to be eliminated followed by surgical deprivement and prompt antifungal therapy the decision about the intensity of treatment will depend on how the patient is worsening the penetration of the drugs at the site of the disease extent of surgical deprivement that is possible magnitude of response in 7 days need for future chemotherapy immunosuppression then rhizopus is less susceptible to azoles kaningamella is more resistant to polymorphs and the af agent and fungal agents so for our pulmonary aspergillosis patients we would treat them with amphotericin b for 7 days and then take them up for surgery so also is for the rhino cerebral um mucor mycosis or your aspergillosis mucor mycosis you would treat them for 5 to 7 days with antifungal therapy followed by surgical debridement the treatment is amphotericin b is the drug of choice as the initial therapy posaconazole 300 mg every 12 hours on first day and 300 mg once daily is an alternative or a step down therapy isavuconazole that is given as 200 mg given every 8 hours for 6 doses followed by 200 mg once daily can also be used as a step down therapy or a salvage therapy 
Then there are anecdotal reports of combination therapy that have been published. This is the largest recommendation that has come for the, from the European Conf Confederation of Medical Mycology in cooperation with the Mycosis Study Group Education and Research Consortium, where they've given a very good flowchart or an algorithm where they have clearly mentioned that surgical debridement with clean margins for three purposes that include disease control, histopathology, and microbiological diagnosis, plus immediate treatment initiation are very, very important. So in these patients, we should avoid the slow escalation of doses as conventionally we've been doing. And you can go up till 5 to 10 milligram per kg of liposomal amphotericin B, start from day one itself. So earlier what we were doing was give 50 milligram, then 200 milligram, then 300 milligram. We are only going up till 5 milligram of liposomal amphotericin B. But this uh, group has strongly recommended that right on day one, start with 5 milligram and you could go as high as up to 10 milligram depending on the severity of the infection per kg body weight. So if there's brain involvement, all the more reason. If there's a solid organ transplant, again, 10 milligram per kg per day right from day one. If there's a pre-existing renal compromise, then one could consider using isavoconazole or posaconazole. And uh, if... Uh, these drugs cannot be crushed, then posaconazole oral suspension can be used. Assess the response every week by imaging. And then if the disease is stable, then continue the first line treatment. If it is uh, progressive, then probably change the drug, change or use a combination of the drugs. So those are the various options that we have available to us. But the three drugs are the ones that are used. So for salvage treatment, posaconazole is used. It's a long molecule with tighter and numerous binding sites to the fungal 14 alpha demethylase. Mutations near the heme confer resistance to the comp compact azoles, but not to the long azoles. Posaconazole plus casofungin has been used in salvage therapy. Deferacerox, this in contrast with the iron chelator deferoxamine, which increases the risk of mucor mycosis, the oral iron chelating agent deferacerox showed a possible benefit when used to treat mucormycosis in urine models. Hyperbaric oxygen has also been used in some patients, but the benefit is yet to be established. As far as the duration of therapy is concerned, it should continue until there is clinical resolution of the signs and symptoms and could extend up till months. If there is good control of underlying medical problems, is very essential. Amphotericin B should be administered for an initial four to six weeks after initial therapy begins to ensure eradication of the infection. Disease must be monitored very carefully for any signs of pre-emergence. Way back in 1955, it carried a very poor prognosis, was associated with a very high morbidity and mortality. Death occurred usually within the first two weeks, if not treated. Depends a lot on the reversibility of the underlying risk factor and early surgical intervention. And the rhinocerebral form mortality rate ranges from 30 to 70%. GI infection ranges from 50 to 70 percent, disseminated up till 90 percent, and patients with AIDS mortality rate is 100 percent. So we'll take another short break before I go on to the fourth and the final part of my talk this evening on antifungal drugs. Uh, thank you, sir, for covering the mucor so uh, nicely, and I'm sure our audience is also very much aware of mucor now because of COVID. The, the upsurge of mucor due to steroids and, and the COVID virus per se uh, in the recent times. Thankfully, it has abated. So I request Dr. Shasti, sir, uh, for his uh, experience with uh, mucor, sir. Yeah. Yeah, okay. See, India is the diabetes capital of the world. And as Dr. Nagya mentioned, that uh, diabetes is one single biggest factor. As a matter of a diabetic ketoacidosis, the patient comes to the intensive care unit. And if he has got other problems, then you should make sure that you have ruled this out. So mucor mycosis and diabetes simply go hand in hand. The other conditions we are quite aware of. And uh, mucor mycosis, perhaps the only conditions where uh, in 2015-16, uh, we have published a study containing around 400 odd patients and we found out that uh, generally speaking, mucormycosis occurs earlier in patients who are admitted to the ICU as compared to the Western literature. In less sick patients, that means the Apache score, even if it is less, doesn't mean that they will not get mucormycosis. And uh, 
and, and generally speaking, the uh, universal risk factor in these patients is uh, uh, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus and uh, with a, a glycosylated hemoglobin of more than eight in these patients. And uh, the diagnosis of these patients is a bit difficult as here as has already been pointed out. But yes, if uh, a, the most common form of uh, mucormycosis is the rhino orbital mucormycosis. And if you get the ENT surgeon involved and he does a bedside um, and uh, endonasal uh, biopsy of the of the necrotic tissue in the nose, we can get the KOH mount reported to us less than in less than 30 minutes, and then we can subject this patient to operation the very next day. Having said that, one need, we need to know that medical therapy alone is not effective in managing uh, mucormycosis. It has to be as accompanied by very very diligent and absolutely cruel. Uh, 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 removal of the uh, debridement of all the tissues involved and if that means uh, that the eye needs to be exonerated so be it and if the nasal tissue needs to be highly uh, uh, has to be has to be debrided uh, uh, very aggressively so be it and then we can do or if the palate is involved remove the palate completely if the teeth are involved then remove the teeth so that is a simple um, uh, anal, uh, a simple way of looking after eradicating this disease because even after having done that, it is very difficult to be sure that you have not removed every piece of mucor that is around there. And vobitide, if you even if you have done all this, if suppose something has entered into the brain uh, through the various orifices that Dr. Nangia mentioned, especially the cavernous sinus and uh, through the optic nerve and the superior orbital fissure, uh, and even the cribriform from plate, for example, then uh, it, the uh, the possibility uh, that the treatment will be offering any benefit to the patient is doubtful and that is why we have to be very careful we have a team of radiologists who did have dedicated themselves to uh, the mri contrast mri findings of mucormycosis patients and they tell us something about the fungal signal if the fungal signal uh, is present in the brain then obviously we tend not to be very aggressive in the management and we, then we tend to manage them only medically but if uh, there are those signals not present in the brain and the this is confined to the eye and the nasal cavity in the sinuses or in the alveoli in the palate those kind of places then we uh, take the consent from the patients and do very aggressive debridement in which more often than not we have done uh, this uh, the exaggeration of the eye so uh, the surgery plays a very important role in managing these patients. The reason why amphotericin B and fluconazole are depicted, I mean, I'm not talking about fluconazole, I'm talking about azoles, which means both posaconazole and uh, isabiconazole, because all these three drugs have penetration into the brain. And uh, they have got excellent penetration in so-called pharmacologically inert sites, such as the eye, the various part of sinuses, and other parts of the body, including the abdominal organs. Echinocandins, we know, cannot pass the blood-brain barrier. It cannot go into the eye. It cannot go into the brain. Its presence in the kidney is very poor. And uh, Dr. Nagia mentioned that mycosis can be present in all these three areas. So echinocandin, and in, it is in any case in vitro not effective against mycosis. So echinocandins are no-no. But yes, amphotericin B is the drug of choice, but of late in our hospital also. More often than not, what we have done in our overzealous uh, attempt to uh, aggressively treat these patients. We have given combination therapy in the form of uh, amphotericin B as well as uh, oral posaconazole or oral disavuconazole. I can't say that I can say with certain amount of confidence that that has given rise to better outcome in this patient. But the treatment has to be very, very long. We have done repeated, repeated, repeated means seven to eight MRIs in this patient. And these MRIs are all contrast enhanced MRIs, which uh, tells us whether the disease is progressing or not progressing. And only when we are sure that the disease is not so progressing, that we are able to cut down or de escalate the therapy to oral posaconazole or oral isoviconazole. And again, in that, I say that oral means I mean the tablet form and not the syrup or not the, uh, the uh, liquid form of posaconazole because the viability of the liquid form is very, very poor. So that is the idea. The treatment is very prolonged, and despite this treatment, there is 50% mortality in these patients. If you do not give treatment, there is mortality. So, mucormycosis is a very much disease of the Indian subcontinent, I would say. The incidence that is reported in the West, we have 10 to 15 times that incidence in our country, and that is why it is imperative for all intensive care physicians and all the patients who are treating sick patients to be aware of this uh, mucormycosis and to diagnose it early and get a team approach. Towards management of these conditions because one team cannot, one 
one person cannot manage it. We need to have a team of surgeons, the ENT people, the ophthalmic people, the pathologists, the, the radiologists, and the microbiologists all sitting together in the team to make an as soon as possible early diagnosis and then as soon as possible early debridement in this patient for, to, for us to have any reasonable kind of cure in this patient. Thank you. Yes, the patient, Thank you, sir, uh, for your uh, uh, Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we are hearing very well nicely. Can you hear me? I'm afraid I have to go. Yes, I've got, to, please, I've got please, another uh, yes. uh, webinar right yes, now. Yes. Please carry on. I have, you'll have to excuse me now. It is yeah. 6 30, yeah, and yeah. 6 30 was the time. Yeah, thank right? you, sir. Thank so I have crossed that time, but I'll join yeah. them. And thank you very much for providing this platform. It was indeed a great pleasure to be moderating somebody as distinguished as Dr. Nangia. Uh, and the pleasure is all mine. Thank you, Dr. Nangia, very much. Thank you, Dr. Shastri, for your pearls of wisdom. They've really been very, very helpful in summarizing the talks very well. So uh, I will just uh, like to. Uh, say a, a couple of things about mucor and aspergillosis, kind of summarize the uh, expert opinion and the valuable comment coming from the vast experience of Nagya and Dr. Shakti, sir. Uh, see, when you get mucor, it is primarily of two types. One is rhinocerebral and orbital, just uh, some said, and the other is pulmonary. A pulmonary mucor mycosis is uh, a very high mortality issue, um, having a mortality of more than 90%. So that should be clear. While rhinocerebral form, which uh, is uh, less uh, aggressive and has a better pr prognosis to the tune of 50 percent but in both the conditions like said just now there has to be extensive debridement and uh, the use of uh, amphotericin with zone, though not in any particular guideline because the trials are not there is advocated and should be done because you die otherwise these are very aggressive diseases and just a few things about the clinical points of mucor if you are having rhinocerebral form of mucor then it is very common to have uh, blackishness over your uh, palate and half of your face also as Dr. Nangya had mentioned this is very specific in actually for mucor and it kind of distinguishes also from aspergillosis and when you have uh, infection of the lungs uh, you know fungal infection of the lungs the two common agents is aspergillosis and mucor of course there are many other agents and we should not just think that there's going to be only aspergillosis and uh, uh, mucor and one of the ways is uh, in pulmonary fungal infections, you get a lot of nodules on the X-ray and subsequently if you do a CT. And the greater the number of nodules, uh, the greater the chances that you're dealing with mucor. The more aggressive the pulmonary disease is, more likely you're dealing with mucor. And mucor pulmonary has a very high uh, modality. So I think that, that was a few things about uh, the summary of uh, pulmonary infections uh, as far as uh, mucor and aspergillosis is concerned and there are few differences. And now I hand it over to Dr. Nangya, sir, for the last session, that is antifungal agent. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tapesh. Now, coming on to the final, the drugs that we use to kill all these fungal agent, fungi. So basically, it was the amphotericin B, which was discovered sometime around 1958, followed by flu cytosine, ketoconazole, fluconazole, itraconazole, and then there's been no looking back since we've got the acanocandins sometime around 2000 and the voriconazole. So the current repertoire basically acts through different mechanisms. The polyenes, that is the amphotericin B, usually acts on the cell membrane. It binds to the ergosterol, leads to depolarization and cell death and rupture. The echinocandins act on the cell wall. They inhibit the cell wall synthesis. The azoles act on the cytoplasm, inhibiting the cytochrome P450 dependent reactions inside. And then the DNA Sorry, the anti-metabolites like the 5-fluorocytosine act on the DNA. So polyenes are the amphotericin B is produced by streptomyces nodosis. So it's it's uh, bacterial in origin. In vitro activity, it is shown against histoplasma capsulatum, coxidiodus, canada species. Blood. So it's a very broad spectrum drug that we have and should be used primarily for treatment of progressive at potentially life-threatening fungal infections and not for non-invasive ones at all. The three formulations that are available to us, in fact, one has been um, discontinued now in the US is the ABCD, which was disc-like particles and carrier lipid was cholesterol, um, cholesterol sulfate. But the one that is commonly used is the ambisome, which is the liposomal amphotericin beat, the dosage of which is three to six milligram per kg body weight. It's a unilaminar liposome carrier lipid is HSPC, DPSG, cholesterol, particle size is 0 0.08 microns. And then the other one is the ABLSET or the ABLC, which is uh, ribbon-like particles and the carrier lipids are DMPC and DMPG. So they all have different carrier lipids 
different uh, dosages and they cannot be interchanged. If you are doing it, then you need to give due consideration to the fact. The conventional amphobe is um, the amphotericin B deoxyculate, which usually is started with a initial test dose of one milligram infused over 20 to 30 minutes. And then the dose is built up gradually to 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg body weight and even 1.5 milligram per kg per day for or given as an IV infusion over four to six hours. The common side effects are hypotension, tachypnea, fever, chills, headache, malaise, body aches, anorexia, diarrhea, epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, stomach cramps, anemia. Hypokalemia is something that you need to watch out for, so you need to keep getting there. Uh, KFT is done frequently, electrolytes tested frequently, hypomagnesemia is seen very commonly, renal abnormalities can happen. And at the site, this is quite a painful injection, so it can result into phlebitis or thrombophlebitis also. Azoles are available for systemic use and can be classified in two groups, the triazoles and the imidazoles. Imidazole is the ketoconazole, which is more for local injections and creams, ointments. Triazoles, we have the fluconazole, itraconazole, bori, posa, isavu. They all have broad spectrum without the serious nephrotoxic effects, but should be avoided during pregnancy. They're involved in many of the important drug-drug interactions, especially via the cytochrome P450 enzymatic reaction. And they vary in spectrum of activity, pharmacokinetics, and toxicities. So fluconazole has a good anti-spectrum activity against the endemic fungi like the histo, blasto, coxidiodo, paracoxidiodo, against candida, but less activity against candida glabrata and no activity against brucei and the molds. Itraconazole is broad spectrum against the endemic fungi as well as the molds. Voriconazole acts against the invasive aspergillosis also. Fusarium, it has a superior activity against the fluconazole resistant candida glabrata and candida cruci, but not against the mucormycosis. Posaconazole and esavuconazole cover the mucormycosis also in addition to all other fungi. So fluconazole, we've discussed this already, so I'll skip this. The relative contraindications would be neutropenia, a severe illness, suspected involvement of the cardiac valves or myocardium, suspected CNS involvement. The dosage varies from the site that is involved if it is oropharyngeal candidiasis, then it should be 200 milligram loading dose and 100 to 200 milligram daily for 7 to 14 days. Esophageal candidiasis is to be treated like a systemic infection. So 400 milligram loading dose, then 200 to 400 milligram daily for 14 to 21 days. Vaginal candidiasis, just a single dose of 150 milligram is sufficient. For UTI, 200 milligram daily for 14 days. And for candidemia and invasive candidiasis, 800 milligram loading dose followed by 400 milligram daily. Voriconazole has good bioavailability after the oral dose also. It's well distributed throughout the body. IV dose is 6 mg per kg every 12 hours for 2 doses followed by maintenance of 3 to 4 mg every 12 hours. Orally is the loading dose is 400 mg twice daily for 2 doses and 200 mg twice daily. And it should be avoided in patients with renal insufficiency where the keratin clearance is less than 50 due to accumulation of the cyclodextrin vehicle. So in these patients with CKD, we always prefer to give them oral voriconazole and never IV. The common side effects that you can encounter with voriconazole are visual changes. They could be transient in nature and occur within 30 minutes of oral or IV administration and last for about 30 to 60 minutes. Abnormal vision, including photopsia or flashes of light, photophobia, color changes. It could also result in periostitis if it is being used for many months. Cardiac toxicity has been reported, which includes cases of QD prolongation, torsero de pointis, cardiac arrest, and sudden death have also been reported. Then it can result in photosensitivity reaction on the skin, as bad as Steven Johnson's have been reported, and has also been linked with skin cancers, like squamous cell carcinomas and melanomas, if used over a prolonged period. Neurological toxicity, visual, I've already spoken, can also result in auditory hallucinations, confusion, agitation, myoclonic movements, peripheral demyelinating neuropathy of lower extremities reported mostly in transplant recipients who are also taking tacrolimus. Then when giving voriconazole, we must monitor the levels of voriconazole. 
especially if there's a suspected treatment failure, suspected suboptimal dosing, suboptimal absorption, non-compliance, neurological toxicity related to overdosing is a possibility, and other toxicity is possibly related to the overdosing, then you may want to monitor the levels of uh, voriconazole. While using voriconazole, you have to be extremely careful with its interaction with so many drugs, including warfarin, sulfonylureas, statins, rifampicin, terfinidin, the anticoagulants, the, no, the novel oral anticoagulants or the directly acting oral anticoagulants. So all these have interactions. So you need to be very careful with these drugs. Posaconazole has been approved for the prophylaxis of invasive fungal infections in patients with hematological malignancies on prolonged chemotherapy, induced neutropenia, hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients with growth versus host disease, graft versus host disease, for step-down therapy or salvage therapy for mucormycosis or other invasive fungal infections. Its dosage is 200 mg three times daily to 400 mg twice daily. The delayed uh, release tablets and IV formulations are also available. The IV formulation should be avoided in patients with moderate or severe renal impairment due to the potential for accumulation of the cyclodextrin molecule even for this. The common side effects for esavuconazole are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, elevated transaminases, hypokalemia, and peripheral edema. They may also cause serious side effects including hepatotoxicity and infusion reactions. Itraconazole has not been used as much, especially in the critical care settings. It is it has an inconsistent bioavailability. It has uh, the adverse effects include a triad of hypertension, hypokalemia, peripheral edema, and there are cases of heart failure also that have been reported. Uh, its absorption increased by concurrent ingestion of cola or cranberry juice and is impaired by drugs that interfere with gastric acidification. Then we come to the echinocandins. Echinocandins has been a major milestone in the antifungal chemotherapy. Three of them, Caspo, Mica, and Anidula fungin. The experience suggests that it is the best tolerated and the safest class of drugs so far available. The successful outcomes in approximately 75% of the patients in each trial has confirmed that, and they have a broad spectrum activity against all species. <clears throat> they are fungicidal against Canada species, including fluconazole resistant glabrata and cruci, relatively low potential for renal or hepatic toxicity, and low serious drug drug interactions. Casofungin is given as a loading dose of 70 mg, then 50 mg daily. Mica fungin 100 mg daily without any loading dose. Anadola fungin requires a loading dose of 200 mg and then 100 mg daily. So, because of the similar spectrum of activity and mechanism of action, the three drugs are considered to be interchangeable. However, they do differ in terms of their dosing, pathways of metabolism, drug interaction profile, MICs and safety to some extent. Casofungin is metabolized through the liver, so is mica fungin, whereas anadola fungin is excreted unchanged into the biliary system. Therefore, the dose of anadola fungin does not need to be adjusted in patients with a hepatic dysfunction. Whereas for casofungin, you need to reduce it from 50 milligram to 35 milligram daily in patients with a child poo score of 7 to 9. This is about the pharmacokinetic differences between the three drugs. What is most important is that the drug interactions with casofungin are significantly higher as compared to mica and anadola fungin. Otherwise, they're all simple. So, principles of antifungal therapy are early adequate treatment followed by de escalation as soon as possible. There are other clinical conditions also where there are other fungi, which I'll skip for the time being and summarize my presentation by saying that fungal infections are quite common in the ICU and are associated with high morbidity, high cost, and mortality. They're difficult to diagnose, difficult to treat, associated with a high mortality. Most of the diagnostic modalities have major limitations. Therefore, medication are usually started on a preemptive basis based on certain clinical prediction scores and suspicion. The three important fungi have three classes of drugs, the amphobi, the azoles, and the academy. Thank you so much for a very patient hearing for these last two hours. And I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any.
thank you sir for your you know exhaustive talk as usual covering practically the length and breadth of uh, fungi and even covering the drugs so that must have been really tiring thank you very much and if there are any questions please put them up and uh, coming to the end of the session i would just like to say a few things about amphotericin you know we have a tendency to go uh, towards uh, liposomal amphotericin given its uh, less side effects but uh, the side effects are just the same the frequency is much less and the severity is less but we have to look at the cost india being a resource limited country and the fact that antifungals have to be used for a, a very long time the cost can be enormous so uh, looking at amphotericin if your patient is not too bad right if the patient is young and you know not having too much of organ involvement and if you think clinically he can take in plain amphotericin that is amphotericin deoxycholate just try uh, amphotericin deoxycholate i have tried it and, and it works it is not that bad the side effects like sir said you can get hypo when you are giving amphotericin you get hypotension chills fever and that is because of a cytokine release that is because of a cytokine release and amphotericin when you give it it causes afferent arterial uh, venal vasoconstriction that is normally uh, there with it and a small ele small elevation in creatinine does occur with amphotericin if it is not occurring then probably your amphotericin is not working so a, a doubling of creatinine to 2.5 something like that depending on what your starting creatinine is is physiological and compatible with plain amphotericin right if it goes beyond that suppose your creatinine is creeping beyond 2.53 then what do you do with amphotericin then you half the dose and give it if the creatinine still continues to rise then you have to stop it so that is about amphotericin and it needs no modification if the initial creatinine is high in a ckd patient or in a liver disease patient initial dose of amphotericin remains the same its pharmacokinetics have not been worked out very well but that is the recommendation so that is about plain amphotericin now a word about liposomal amphotericin we all know it has their side effects and uh, it is wonderful and all that and th that is the go to drug but why does it have less side effects it co is called liposomes attached to it right we all know that that's why it's called liposomal amphotericin so how does that work one because it is bound to liposomes it does not filter through your glomerula it is a heavy molecule and the toxicity is renal right your plain amphotericin filters through and it causes tubular injury the amount of liposomal amphotericin that filters through is only 10% of plain amphotericin second it has a less toxic reaction the cytokine response and the afferent arterial constriction is less with liposomal amphotericin third it binds much more to the fungi because of its liposomal attachment to the amphotericin the liposomal mediate attachment of amphotericin to the fungi so the serum levels as such are less so the filtration decreases the gfr filtration fourth is that there is an uptake of amphotericin in the renal tubules it's not gfr it's circulating in the interstitium and there's an uptake in the renal tubules which is through the hdl ldl molecules etc etc which prevent liposomal amphotericin being taken up by tubules there are thereby again decreasing the concentration in the renal tubules so that is how liposomal amphotericin actually decreases the toxicity of uh, amphotericin and that is why it works better than amphotericin but again try amphotericin and understand amphotericin it has a significant impact on the cost and uh, i think uh, that is all that i have to say i think there are no more questions sir and uh, dr nagya sir again if you have any comments to say or should we close it i think it was very exhaustive and everything has been covered by you and uh, dr shastri's comments sir and uh, if it is okay then we shall we close it or you want to have some concluding remarks no i think we've covered everything possible as far as our day to day activities with fungal i mean fungal infections and antifungals are concerned great sir uh, thank you thank you very much so nagesh sir see you again sometime take care sir bye thank you very thank much you. thank you so much for having me today